Hey, all right, looking good. All right, you guys. Um, this digestive system is uh, it's pretty straightforward in terms of anatomy. You know, some of the different and things like that. I guess the hardest part is we get to uh, some of the enzymes and digestion, you know, chemically. I think that's the hardest for me. Uh, but uh, it's a lengthy chapter because it goes everywhere from teeth and chewing to your stomach to your intestines and then brings in bile in the liver and, and enzyme digestion. Oh, good stuff, all good stuff. Um, and again, that nutrition chapter, I'll talk about vitamins, minerals, and carbs, and things like that. I'll or do a little bit of uh, fats that I did last semester. Good stuff in the rest of the way. A reproductive system chapter. I recorded three lectures to turn into. And uh, again, I'm not going to talk about, ask you about meiosis and some of those details. But look at my lectures, look at my college lectures, see what I have to do. I'll make a question. We don't do a lot of we don't do all the chapters in the book. We don't do uh, pregnancy and uh, genetics and things like that. So way too much. All right, so let's take a look. This person took a picture of every meal they ate for three months. All right, you guys should try that. I see a lot of pie. I don't know who eats that pie. This is like kind of old, but uh, a lot of pie. Um, and uh, this is going to be. We worry about calories. You have millions of calories in your life. And um, what happens is all these different kinds of food. And really, we talk about nutrition, it's so cool that people in different parts of the world have a real different diet. But they end up, as long as you have the basic building blocks, uh, you're going to be able to survive and have all the nutrients that you need. So you need a minimum amount of calories, and you need to have a complete diet to get all the amino acids and vitamins you need. But yeah, all this stuff is going to get uh, broken down. You're going to chew it. Usually, I guess you could just not chew it and that's kind of dumb, but uh, uh, your food is going to be, uh, we break it down to small pieces so there's lots of surface area so we can then chemically digest it. So we're going to physically digest it by chewing it up, putting saliva on it, swallowing it. This is like a milkshake in your stomach. And then um, it continues on its way to be chemically digested. You can only absorb, you can't absorb like a host. You don't absorb like a bird. Really. You're just going to absorb the basic building blocks amino acids, uh, fatty acids, triple sugars. You know, everything that is broken down chemically. And as humans and mammals, we need a lot of calories. They're so expensive. We use some 90% of our calories lost as heat. So we're just so expensive because we have high body temperature. We're always ready to go. As opposed to a salamander that's same temperature as the environment, it, it's much better, much more efficient. Salamander, a snake, all the calories it eats, a huge percentage goes into making babies and making itself. We burn off so much because of stuff. And so, of course, the food is our raw material. We're not plants. If we were autotrophic, we could just go in the sunlight. And again, I have that dream of putting a uh, chlorophyll tattoo. Where you put it in the sun, so just put sugar in your blood. Technically possible, our immune system is going to attack it now. But the spotted salamander has algae that lives within its cells, so I think. But so we need to take our food. We have to steal it. We have to kill animals or eat the plants, kill plants and eat them. So we can't make our own food from carbon dioxide and from that. And then we break it all down. Uh, let's take it physically, chewing it, stomach is going to. A pound on it, and then uh, chemical. And you break it down these base things, you shoot some, uh, things that can be absorbed into your blood. And so when you swallow something, it's not really in your body because the digestive tube is open on both ends, just like on its way out, but it may be absorbed into your bloodstream. Because in your bloodstream, you have it, it's not as hard as you don't. And then um, all of these meats, you can't digest it all, you know, that shell and shrimp put up a lot of. Um, Plant material it goes through as waste. And then we'll see, we have more bacteria than we do in our own cells living inside of us. So, pretty amazing. And we need it for the raw materials to build us or make babies, and we need to burn it as a fuel. As a fuel as well. All right, so this tube is hollow on either end. And it uh, starts out as a simple tube when we're a ball of cells, simple tube. 
called the endoderm, is that inner layer, and uh, becomes fancy in us. We end up making different specialties in the stomach and intestines and esophagus. But it's, it starts out as a simple tube. All this tube has the same layers on it. Mucosa, muscle layer, all that. The smooth muscle moves the angle along. In one direction, unless you're bothered. And we call this tube the alimentary tract or the GI tube, gastrointestinal tract. Now, like, if you swallow a penny, it's not really in your body that you're going to, you're literally not going to get around. It's absorbed in your body. What's Yeah, so we're going to talk about this tube in general today. We're going to talk about, I think it's down to teeth, saliva, and all. So I'm only going to be like up here, really. And then uh, I'll continue this later. Um, but it's going to just be specialized. So the esophagus is just a hallway, it just carries the food from your mouth to your stomach. Nothing happens. The stomach, it gets hit with acid, and it's pepsin, it breaks out proteins, and it's pummeled for hours before it's slowly leak down into your small intestine. Small intestine is where you can absorb almost everything, all the sugars, all the proteins, everything, the new acids. The large intestine is just going to reabsorb all that water that was squirted in there, and it just makes the waste ready to go. So indeed, it's not ash, it's just a cat. Um, but indeed, uh, so we'll talk about starting with your teeth and how you chew it up, we're gonna physically hit it. And if I ask you, where does digestion start? Mouth. If it's hit with saliva, it's just gonna have this uh, amylase that breaks down starches. So immediately in your mouth, you've got some physical or chemical digestion. We'll talk about swallowing. Our tongue pushes into the back of our, our pharynx. Our pharynx is kind of a reflex, so we push it down. Our blottis covers our windpipe, our esophagus opens up, and then it goes down the esophagus behind the heart, and it goes through the diaphragm into the stomach. And then it's just a slow, it's a slow movement. Uh, if we went too quickly, you wouldn't be able to get all the nutrients. So it really depends on the animal, but you know, we keep our food in here, we slowly move it through this tube so that we have time to digest it and to absorb it. And again, the large intestine is going to reclaim. Salts and things like that for the bacteria. But an important part of digestion is absorption. That's when it goes into our bloodstream. Only the basic building blocks can amino acids, glucose, fatty acids. They all have to be broken down into small little pieces and we can absorb. So, tons of blood vessels on our intestine. They're going to absorb the water, the vitamins, the nutrients. A bolus is a uh, when you swallow this, when you, your food in your mouth is this wet uh, ball of food that you push back your throat. So, yeah, the feces is good. All right, so again, you know, I wonder why we do histology. It comes into every single cat. You can't understand gross anatomy uh, without really completely understanding what it looks like microscopically. So, mucosa is the inner line. We'll talk about the differences too. What kind of epithelium do you think your uh, esophagus has? Kind of like squamous, cuboidal, columna. Anyone have a good guess? Imagine you saw a bunch of pretzels, but you didn't quite chew them. Ah, it's pretzels when they go. Probably want that to be kind of like you know, so it's kind of it's not damaged, just like your skin has friction on it. Then you need your stomach, the mucosa has got to be wicked um, tough, man, because it's filled with acid and enzymes. So, you're going to see the stomach mucosa, columnar, lots of mucus cells. They help protect it from digesting itself. And then when I think about small intestines, the rest of the intestines are all columnar, big old tall cells because you're really active. They're absorbing, they're making enzymes. So, really big. so it makes sense. As you go down, the mucosal layer the inside is important. It's going to be able to function. It's going to be able to provide, or it's going to be able to it's got to be a good uh, barrier too, because uh, it's a good way for uh, bad guys, pathogens, to get into your uh, into your body through the digestive tract, right? Because you eat this uh, bad sushi, or, you know, something, uh, drink the water, and then you're going to have to drink the water, and obviously, you know, you can get sick that way. So, um, right underneath this, the layer of the mucosa is a lot of uh, immune system cells. 
And we'll see along the way lots of uh, glands to secrete mucus and water to keep things moving, lubricate things, right? So you're always shoving water and mucus in there to keep the food moving. Collagen test is a, a chance to like reabsorb that water so you don't lose all the water. All right, so when I say digestion, Oh, digestion, the digestion, 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 And we're going to see that tube that I talked about as part of it. So that elementary canal, that tube, then you have these big glands that dump into it, like your liver, your pancreas, stick gland. So we're going to see these accessory things that go into the uh, digestive tube. Yeah. Now, so take a look. You guys know a lot of this. It's pretty straight. You know what the stomach is, you know what your liver is. We're going to get into detail. Like, like, when I ask what your liver did, I think, oh, well, it breaks down alcohol, you know. But I'll talk about more details about all these things. But I think you guys come in with the background. Like, I know the digestive system. I know the TVs about this. So take a look. Mouth and break it down and begin breaking carbs. I'm alluding to that already. So there's an enzyme that breaks down carbs in the mouth. Your pharynx is the back of your throat. That's where the food is pushed and you swallow. It just goes very quickly down the esophagus into the stomach. And then it's, it's gone behind the heart, you know, behind the lungs. It's going to go through the diaphragm into the stomach. And uh, the stomach is uh, this sack that's going to allow you to go to the buffet, load up, and then go home and digest it properly, right? You know, like a lion is that. Um, but it's going to hit it with acid. And that acid will help you know, kill off some of the pathogens. It's going to start breaking down proteins in the stomach. The deal is it's really physical too. Your stomach is churning, breaking it down after you've already chewed it, but breaking down more, making it into kind of like this milkshake like consistency. And then it slowly squirted into the biggest part, the small intestine. So from here to the door, that's how long it is. Really long. And uh, during the small intestine, the food, now it's like a milkshake, slowly goes through it and allows you to absorb the nutrients. A large intestine, like it absorbs water and electrolytes and it forms waste. Rectum is straight, like rectus abdominis. Right? So, same little part just before the anus, which is the same Accessory organs, salivary glands. I'm going to talk about all these today. I mean, I talk about this today. Makes uh, like a liter, more than a liter of spit every day. You don't think about it because you just follow it all the time, you know. But all this spit's going to be mixed with the food if you chew it. And the biggest organ in your body is this liver. This liver is huge. We talked about already, it's where you make the proteins, you know, the bile, or the gallbladder. The rest of the digestion, we're talking about a lot of it about liver made bile. Going to the gallbladder, squirt it onto the small intestine, it helps you break down the acid. And then the pancreas. The pancreas we talked about at the endocrine system, at the beginning of this semester. It makes insulin and glucagon. But the biggest part of the pancreas makes pancreatic juice. And the juice is going to help neutralize that acid from the stomach. And it's got tons of enzymes to break down everything. Enzymes for fats, enzymes for proteins, enzymes for carbs. So that's the biggest part. That's where the pancreas goes most. All right, what do you guys think? Straightforward, right? You got the tube, different parts of the tube. You got that on the far side of the screen. Over here, we have accessory organs that squirt into that tube. We'll get to all these in detail. Yeah. I don't think I need this. Basically, if you want to just sit, because I think I'm reviewing it nicely for you guys. Uh, but it consists of from your text, it goes through everything from chewing the food, you know, all the way down. But so it's nice, you guys, you can see it when you're studying. Uh, all right, we're going to start up here in the mouth. Start right in the mouth, and we're going to go through the teeth. I'll get all the teeth. Uh, yeah, so it seems like we got a lot of time for this, but uh, we go through it in detail. All right, so your food's taken in through the mouth, and we have these lips. 
<laughs> and uh, it's a male thing having lips, you know, lots of the kiss. Probably not, uh, I'm not your thoughts on that, but it is, it's where your food first hits your mouth, allows you to take the temperature, to the texture of food. The question is, for more just mammals for suckling, you make a seal, be able to, as we're a baby, be able to get milk from mom. And then we'll see how uh, we have these cheeks, and then uh, these teeth. The hardest part of our body is these teeth. They fit together nicely usually and allow us to really break down the food. And of course, as mammals, we have a hard palate, so we can breathe while we chew. You guys take that for granted. You're sitting there talking with your friends, chewing, you know, but uh, an alligator or a bird, like, they gotta like just kind of swallow the food quickly because they, they want to be able to breathe. But we can have this hard palate so we can breathe through our nose while we chew. Yeah. You gotta take it for granted, but I wanna have a cool Lips, Angelina. It's for random lips, but um, these fleshy protuberances. And uh, we'll actually see that the red color is not pigment at all, but it's the blood vessels that we can see. That's why your lips turn blue if it's really cold, from an oxidized blood green. You're looking at the blood. And they're fleshy, those along with the cheeks allow us as babies to suckle them up. You knew there's gonna be a histology, all right? Well, here's a lip. Here's a slice of a lip. It hurts my lip to think about it, but a slice of a lip. And uh, it's always muscle, right? That uh, vincularis boris is where you pucker your lips. So I see muscle in there. I see a lot of glands down here. It's going to secrete, make it moist, especially on the inside of your lip, make it wet there. And uh, this redness, again, is just um, blood vessels. Called the vermilion border. It's red between your, your skin and the, and the red. And what you have is stratified squamous on the outside. And if you have a mustache, you have a lot of big hair up here. And then uh, as soon as you hit that, that border, then it turns, there's no hair, it's your fleshy lips. And then um, as you go on the inside of your lip, it gets all um, wet, right? So there's some stratified squamous keratinized, you have stratified squamous inside your mouth. Right. So it's always wet in there, wet in there. Um, it's thin. It's really you want to be able to resist um, Scraped around, like that. It's not keratinized. Means lots of nerves. Oh my God, your lips from the kiss area is very sensitive, right? So lots of nerves. It allows you when you're taking your food to really get some information, you know, as as uh, about temperature and texture as you're eating. It's the first, you know, thing people think to their lips before they are going to chew. It allows you to say, no, this is, I shouldn't eat this, or I should. Along with smell, telling you to buy. Yeah, so the muscle, the subicular porous, goes around and allows you to cover your lips. Skeletal muscle, one of the facial muscles. The subicular porous, we learned last semester. Yes. Oh, baby. Um, babies are particularly cute. I don't have any babies, but they're cute. Yeah. Actually, I can't help it because it's biologically ingrained in me. Or baby animals. There's a cool study about Disney and Mickey Mouse. I can look at Mickey Mouse in the 30s to like when he evolved, like in the 50s and 60s. They made him look more childlike. He used to have a long nose and big ears and small eyes. Now the eyes are big and it looks, you know, childlike. It makes him look, oh, cute, you know? Goofy on the other hand, that's not kind of natural. But, um, and then people think that um, babies love you, you know, like, because you know why? Because I, I put my face there, it smiles. It's whatever. Um, and it turns out it's just a reflex. If you took a, a paper plate and just with a sharpie drew a face and put it, the baby would smile. That just blows your, like it doesn't love you. It's made you smile so that you feel like it loves you so you don't kill the girl. Really, it's, I mean, you don't say, so, so you feel that bond. Anyway, I'm digressing. Um, these big cheeks, you see a baby that are so cute. So they have particularly a bunch of fat there. Wrinkle fat fat. And as they're suckling, it helps you know the cheeks from collapsing because their life is just sucking on a bottle of mom. And these cheeks, of course, the muscle in it is buccinated. Look at us reviewing, right? Buccinated. Some of you call it buccinated, but don't do that. <laughs> buccinated, I call it. Um, and um, yeah, I showed you a picture when we did that muscle of the Izzy Gillespie playing the trumpet. So uh, we have here some muscles on the sides, and as you chew, your tongue moves the food over your teeth, and the cheeks move it back. So the key 
keep the food you're chewing like over the surface of your molars. So imagine your tongue working with your teeth to keep the food, the granola, over your molar so it's, it's at the right place so you can grind it down. So if you can eat air along the tongue, we'll talk a lot about that. It's another muscle. It's going to keep the food over your teeth and us so we can grind it down. All right, let's see from the book. Cheeks, lateral walls of the mouth, holds the food onto the chin. The uh, lips surround the mouth, lots of sensory around the mouth. The tongue we're going to see is also is, is moving the food around. And also, we're talking about taste. Our, our taste buds there. The palate is the root of your mouth. Feel that? Feel the ridge of that? That's going to separate uh, the oral cavity from the nasal cavity, allows you to chew on your teeth. And then the teeth, of course, are going to be in your mandible and your maxillary bones. And they're going to occlude or meet so that you can grind up this food or bite off that hunk of meat. Yeah. Right. You guys need your stuff. Okay. All right, so in your oral cavity, uh, the roof is made up of your fire palate, soft palate. The floor has your tongue on it, it makes up most of it. The lateral walls are your cheeks. The back of it is going to be, this is this uvula that hangs down, but um, the back of it will be like this arch. Behind it is the oral pharynx. The oral cavity is in front of this little arch right here. And uh, this little area between your, your teeth and your, 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 your uh, between your gums and your limbs is called the vestibule. So the vestibule will keep your chew in. This little area right here. Ah, I think I'll show it later, but frenulum, a frenulum is a little, uh, oh, a little connection kind of thing. So you have a labial frenulum at the bottom and the top. If you look, hold on your lip, you see it's kind of attached here. Some people, it's so big that they, they cut it because it makes their teeth spread apart a little bit. So there's one under your tongue, too, a frenulum under your tongue. Look at that cut, too, they have the problems. So a little frenulum, this, you have a labial frenulum and a lingual frenulum, kind of in the midline. And I've already talked about tonsils. You guys know it's lymphatic tissue, right? And the palatine tonsils are the obvious ones in the back of your, your throat there. And the back of your tongue is the lingual tonsils. And you all have talked about tonsils now in your room, but uh, they don't do it as much for us. They do quite as much. And then your adenoids, are uh, from your nasal cavities. Yeah, here's some tonsillitis. Right? Oh. All right, so the palate. Oh my God, you guys know the two bones that make up the hard palate? Yep, I do. So I hope that I do, right? The front is going to be the maxilla. Palate about your maxilla, and then your palatine bone the back. So there's a bony roof of your mouth, I mean, roof of your uh, yeah, mouth, oral cavity. And the soft palate behind it is cartilage. And then your uvula is a little dangly thing that hangs down. Then you look, yeah, this is a danger area here. This is your pharynx, and you can see that there's a chance for air and pain to mix up, right? You can choke you. So there's this area in your, in your larynx, as your vocal cords, you normally you're just pushing air past them. Your esophagus is behind it, normally closed, it's much smaller. Look at the tongue, it's huge in your mouth. It's going to allow you to manipulate food as you chew it. By swallowing, this should close, it should push it back. Yeah. Here's your teeth. Look at view looking up there. So when I feel my hard palate, the skin is really tightening against the bone, isn't it? There's probably ridges, your cat has like a bunch of ridges. Yeah. Right up there. There's some little glands, there's a few little taste buds up there too. I'll say it's like really hard skin attached. And then your gums, of course, surround your teeth. Your soft palate means cartilage back there. And some people have issues with their soft palate, they snore a lot, or they get that sleep apnea where it keeps interrupting the food. So the soft palate sometimes is too big. Yeah. Gums, we call it ginger gum. Uh, the uvula. You'll see that in trivia night a lot. You guys, if you took AP, you'll get you know some of these anatomy questions good. The uvula is this little, uh, little punching bag in the back of the throat there. Uh, you'll 
sensitive to kind of show the dead. Behind it, there you can see there's a vacuum coat of air. And if you look in the, you know, the flashlight, you see this flame or you have strep throat or something like that. Piercing it, man, that's gotta hurt. Um, and this one's split, I don't know, that's kind of cool. Um, yeah, so the uvula back there in the soft palate, um, their purpose is they're gonna close off the nasal cavity back here in this hole. Or bottom. Okay. Hard palate back there uh, will close off this nasal cavity as you swallow so the food doesn't go up into your nose for like milk and you're laughing while you're talking. So this soft palate uvula is gonna close off the nasal cavity so the food only can go down. That's the idea. Doesn't always work. All right, I'll talk about the tongue. So the tongue is a skeletal muscle. You control it. And oh my god, you guys remember the cranial nerves? You got four or five of those things. A couple for taste, trigeminal for touch, and then hypoglossal for movement. Damn, a little bit of vagus in the back. Yeah, five cranial nerves. So for all, the tongue is going to be um, with the lips too, is how you're you're going to sense what you're eating, the environment, right? You're going to taste it, you're going to get the texture, the temperature. And as you remember, uh, smell is, is more fine than taste. And so as you eat something, sure your tongue is going to tell you it's salty and sweet or things like that. But a lot of it that the enjoyment of the meal is, is smell. It's a huge muscle, big muscle in your mouth. And um, if you look at it in a microscope, it looks like tons of skeletal muscle. Be fat there. And you think about muscles like biceps, you know where they're attached. They shorten and they like shorten that joint. The tongue is weird. Think about sticking out your tongue. Like how the hell do you do that, right? Because there's no like connection here, you know, out here. And it's just because of the way it is. There's a whole bunch of muscles. There's uh, intrinsic muscles in the tongue going like Make uh, you know, it weird, really stuff your tongue, intrinsic muscles, and then extrinsic go from bones to the tongue. It allows you to, you know, it's kind of like a bar of soap kind of pushing out. You, you kind of push out like that and move it right and left. Anyways, there's a lot of muscles in here. You guys don't know what I'm going to do. Oh, yeah, you can go to a uh, market basket and buy a tongue. It's delicious in lingua. Tacos. It's just muscle. You take off the, the membrane, take off the taste buds. Otherwise, it's just skeletal muscle. It's delicious. Try it. Oh, look at that. Beautiful. Oh my God. All those muscles in there. And then these glands, you're going to make it so it's wet. You can see it needs saliva in order to taste anything. You see a lot of glands within the tongue and in your mouth and a big salivary gland. So you're pumping out all this fluid in your mouth. And I'm looking at the top of the tongue there. This one has a lot of, this must be cat or hamster or something. Now you can see it has lots of little, uh, it's kind of rough. Now the uh, underside of your tongue, if you look in the mirror, it has, it's like a clear membrane. You can really see those blood vessels, right? If you guys want to pierce your ears on your own, you know, I'd say go for it. But if you want to pierce your tongue, get a professional. <laughs> because there are some big arteries in your tongue. And if you hit those, you gotta go to the emergency room, right? So there's there's arteries, you can see the vein of the name on either side. So yeah. I know some piercers, they would say don't pierce your own pierce your ears either. But anyway, the tongue, um, the underside of it is a stratified squamous non keratinized And uh yeah, for your pharmacy people, it's one way you can get drugs into your system, right? It's a lingual. And it's the nitroglycerin pill, but in your mouth is gonna get absorbed. So uh, drugs can be very rapidly absorbed. And this is just muscle, skeletal muscle. It's this powerful muscle in your mouth. It's kind of weird throwing it up on the table like that. But there's your tongue, you look at it. The, um, the back of your tongue, you can't see except maybe with a mirror and look in the, the light. It's uh, really rough back there. That lingual tonsil is like back, the root of your tongue back there. You can't see. And on the surface, you see little bumps, little bumps, little papillae. Um, there's ones that go like here, like kind of like a uh, ratio of juice lines and stuff. But certain valley pathway is big ones. You can see those kind of like a groove out there. And behind that, the groove is behind. Yeah, the demogodus. You don't usually see that, but. 
So the body and the knee. Okay. Yeah. And these little papilla are little numbers. Sometimes you see is that people get inflamed ones. The guy that is inflamed, you know, papilla on their tongue, but normally you don't see them. They're kind of in a rough surface. And I'll just talk about a couple of these. Um, there's ones here, these filiform ones, they're just keratins. There's no taste going on. And that's what you see, you know, you look at a cat's tongue, even a, a cow or a, a lot of animals have these rough tongues like this. And uh, of course, what does a cat use this for? Grooming and uh, licking and rasping the meat off the bones, you know. So these are just keratin, there's no taste going on. Sometimes they're rough like that. And these little fungiformy, like little fungi, like little mushroom ones. And these are the ones that mainly we have over our tongue for taste. So we'll have taste buds around them, little tiny taste buds. A lot of these little ones. And uh, you can see, you can kind of stain to see them if you kind of looking at them for some reason. Uh, but the taste bud, uh, the, the, the capital of the fungiform is not a taste bud. Taste buds are microscopic. I'll show you this. Uh, folates, things like pages of the book, a good library, the folio, and then the big ones are these circumvalids. So here's one of these big, big uh, lumps. And then here's the size of the taste buds. These are like clear, uh, shaped things. Those are actual taste buds. These papilla are big, you see them in So you see, here's some that are really enlarged. But these are the circumvalli, and uh, it separates the, the, the body from the rooting root. You don't see this back part of the screen. All right, talk about taste buds, and then I promise I'll make a break. So the taste buds are these, they're, they're little, they're, they look clear in the microscope. And unlike smell, um, you're going to see the taste buds, you have a limited number of tastes. And, uh, these are the same, though. They have little cilia, little hairs that have uh, receptors for chemicals, like salt, like sweet, right? And um, these are neurons, the parts of the neurons that will have a nerve that goes back into your brain that tells you what kind of taste is on your tongue. It has to be wet. You can't taste anything with a dry tongue. As long as it's dissolved, the basic taste in these taste bud cells will uh, take it, the signal back to your brain. And um, they're replaced. So you think to yourself, oh, I ate that habanero, I'm never going to taste it again. It's okay. They're going to be replaced. You got them scattered all over your tongue, and some on your cheek and roof of the mouth, and back to the tongue. So that's how you taste. And I'll go back to uh, talk to Fred Dinner and all the dancers, all the taste centers. Oh, so it lasts about 10 days. All right, so a week, right? <laughs> you, uh, yeah, you burn them off and you make them. And you can see the little hairs here are going to have receptors for chemicals, and then the nerve is going to go back to your tongue and your brain. So as soon as you had a taste in your mouth, your brain's made aware of it, then your cerebrum says, what the hell is that, and this, and that. Yeah, and our tastes are, of course, these. And I talked about this when we did last semester, right? Talked about smell and taste. So just real quickly, I'm not going to spend a lot of time here, but you know these are the basic tastes. There used to be four tastes. Sweet, sour, salty, bitter. Then then umami was added. It has MSG, glutamates, um, kind of savory taste. It tells your body, hey, this has got a protein, it's got amino acid in it. But sweet tells you it's got a lot of calories. You like sweet, right? You like umami. Sour and bitter often mean it could be a toxin, it could be something bad, you know. Well, we, we like sour patch kids and uh, bitter beer and coffee. So I mean, we don't you know automatically dismiss it, but things that are bitter or uh, Especially bitter often mean toxins and it's bitter out there. And then saltiness, we like salty too because we create sodium right? and electrolytes. Cool. And this was outdated, it was in textbooks forever. Actually, all those taste buds are scattered throughout. So there may be like a little more sweetness now, but this is not, this used to be in the textbooks. This is the truth, but it's not. And then it's umami. Again, umami is a uh, beautiful savory and cheeses and tomatoes. Uh, things that it, it gives you this flavor um, that tells you this has got glutamine, it's got amino acids, it's got protein. I like. 
And of course, in the world of a taste, um, you don't eat pure salt. You don't eat pure sugar. But uh, it's usually everything is a mix. And so it's a beautiful thing. I mean, one of the joys of life is enjoy good beer, wine, food, tasting. It's a, your brain is lit up with, with, with all these different tastes and smells to give us this joy. So uh, things are a mixture of things, and your mind is immediately told what's in your mouth and what's in your nose. And again, just from last semester, but you guys remember that smell is much more detailed. This is like someone breaking down all the different kinds of smells. Here's the taste. The taste is a one instant. When you're enjoying a good meal, if you have a cold, you might as well not waste the money because if you bring the food to your mouth and it's in your mouth, you can take wine, you swish it in your, in your mouth so that there's, there's chemicals going into your, your smell. So smell is really uh, more important than us in taste, but we have more. I mean, some people are super tasters and um, they hate, I mean, they don't really like Brussels sprouts or cabbage or broccoli. It tastes, uh, you guys probably tell me, they crappy, I don't know, it's really uh, yeah, the, um, bitter. Yeah, bitter, yeah, yeah, yeah. And then my brother hates cilantro. I love cilantro. That's another whole genetic thing how, how they like this. But he's a, uh, about a quarter of you are super tasters, about a quarter of you don't taste so well, and half of you are kind of in the middle. And some super tasters don't like, even some diet sodas are really bitter. So you can test it. All right, cool. Uh, I've been talking a lot this time. Any questions so far? Such good stuff. All right, All right we'll take a break. We, just, we have left uh, teeth and uh, salivary glands. So we'll take a four minute break. I haven't done this for a while, let's see. So 11.49, we'll begin.
All right, you guys, appreciate your patience. You know, I've been actually not talking for a long time. I know. Yeah. Hopefully, it's good stuff. Hope you're enjoying. Hopefully, you recognize a lot and just add on some new things here. Uh, so, teeth, saliva, and then we'll get to like the basics of the guts. Then, uh, leave the rest for a couple other lectures on this. All right, so you guys, you imagine some multiple choice questions so far in the final? And, uh, Hey, here's my teeth. Uh, I mean, they're a little different now, but pretty good, by the way. But I have an implant here. Uh, you can see where it's been remodeled right there. So you lose a tooth, and um, it'll fill up pretty quickly with bone. And I talked about this with bone, actually. It's filled up with this woven bone, like this temporary kind of thing. And then over time, it'll be remodeled. And, um, you know, I could live without this second molar down there. You can't really see it, but. Problem is, if you, if you just leave it like this, these, these upper teeth will, will hyper erupt. They, they need to touch the tooth on top and the bottom. So this would keep growing out like that over time. It would take years and years. So you bite the bullet, you spend the money, and uh, well, if you have the money, you have health care, like all this stuff. But um, you can put a, a drill a hole in here and put a little, and then they can put a cap on there. Uh, and you see these cavities, you know, jump out. But, your teeth are the hardest part of your body. And so often when you look at, um, I think it's forensically, you want to get rid of the body, in there, I should put it, but uh, teeth, you know, want to get rid of the dental records. And uh, also just in uh, paleontology, we, 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 we describe whole families of like woolly mammoths and animal, rhinoceroses and things based on just the teeth. Because the teeth are hanging around, they're so hard. Well, the rest of the bone will disintegrate over time. The teeth uh, tend to hang around the longest. So. You look at a skeleton, teeth, you look at fossils, you get a lot of teeth. Because teeth are this hard, hard material that will withstand it. So, teeth. Do birds have teeth? No, a lot of birds, fossils have teeth. And turtles? Uh, we have teeth. We chew the hell out of our food um, and we get into really small pieces because we're freaking expensive. We need so many calories. We have to eat a lot, we've got to break it down so it can get through us. Enough surface area so we can take out all those nutrients. So our teeth are not only uh, nice teeth, but they meet really well. They include with each other, so we're able to really grind our food into small enough pieces to get a lot of surface area so we can absorb it. Indeed. And that's uh, part of the reason why we think our skulls are so akinetic, why there's only one joint. You look at fish, our things, they have many joints in the skull that can move it. Ours is solid, we just did our jaw moves. But it's so that our teeth can occlude and meet each other. We can really chew our food. So our teeth are they meet beautifully. They serve their functions, but they're so hard they're going to allow us to last throughout most of our life. In fact, that's how elephants usually die when they're in their whole divorces. They, their teeth wear down and they can eat them. So, yeah, you guys have All right, so. Um, this temporal mandibular joint, remember that thing? Really, you get TMJ if you clench your teeth, things like that. So this joint is very complex. It allows us to slide forward and backward, side to side, all the these joints. That TMJ joint is, is uh, subject to um, wear and tear. And uh, what else? Let's see. And of course, when you look at teeth too, it's sometimes you know, our teeth are for intimidation of biting people. <laughs> biting other animals, you know? If you look at a big uh, gorilla and it's huge, you know, canine, some of it is for that, you know, but for blowing mainly we're talking about the truth. And you look at our teeth, we seem to have an omnivorous diet. Like we're not a carnivore, it'd be your cat's teeth. It just has the molars are like scissors, they're really sharp. There's a few of them, and it's got these big canines, right? Look at a horse, got some incisors in front, and no canines, usually big flat molars for chewing. So you can look at our teeth and say, Kind of in between. We have we do have canines, but we do have these nice molars. Ooh, we have deciduous teeth. We have two sets. We have two sets. It's so cool. Um, 
deciduous like those deciduous trees out there, they lost their leaves. Deciduous teeth, we lose them, they fall out in new ones. And so our baby teeth, or our first set, does it matter if they get cavities? I'm supposed to say yes, right? But they're gonna fall out. <laughs> the second one, if you lose the second one, there's no third set, all right? So you really gotta watch those adult teeth. Let your um, so look at our baby teeth, you can see we have uh, just a couple of molars, a canine and a couple of sizes. And, uh, yeah, they come in a certain order, the size was first, moms get bit, things like that. And then um, these will all fall out, and we have the permanent set. We have 32 teeth, 16 on the top, 16 on the bottom. And we have, we're going to see we have three molars, two premolars, canine, and a couple of sizers. And, uh, each of the four quadrants. You don't have to memorize the dates, uh, but I'm just showing you. People, many people are reading the right now, and uh, they're going to read it soon. Oh, okay, well, first one's coming in. I don't know. Oh, yeah, like a year old. Oh, a little less. So that, that first one will come in front, and they generally lost in the same order. So you'll have a little, little, little kid, little baby, and the first tooth will be this incisor that comes out almost always. And then, um, uh, and, uh, as you come down, you'll see that these uh, third molars. Oh yeah, it's probably one that they never come out because your wisdom teeth are the last molars. Yeah. Cool. So, like six years old. Okay, yeah. So, I mean, you should know you're like six, seven, eight, or something. Perfect teeth come out. Yeah, six years old. And I know they come out and like they want to leave the first ones. But otherwise, I'm not going to ask. Well, you guys, to so you guys in dental hygiene and doing dentistry, um, we give numbers to all these teeth. Um, you don't have to know these numbers, from me, but uh, you can number them off. So, number 15, go at the buccal side and the lingual side, you know, about that. I remember cleaning the teeth and they would say, well, RBC, and, you know, you know like, you read what? Oh, yeah, we don't have to say a lot. But yeah, there's an old lingo. You're in the teeth as you go along. And, uh, yeah, they're the same amount the top and the bottom. They're just uh, we call the bottom ones your uh, mandibular teeth, and the upper ones your maxillary teeth. The maxillary and mandibular teeth, and they're the same. You've got central and the lateral incisor. Are you into this? I guess I should have known. You've got a central and a lateral incisor. We just do one quadrant. So central incisor, lateral incisor, then our canine teeth. They've got the deepest roots. Some people that are really pointing out there. And then you have two premolars. And then three molars. And the third molar is your wisdom teeth. So some people they come in wrong, they never come out, and things can happen there. Our jaws are a little too small for all those people. So that's it. And so if I, I talk about one tooth, and I can ask you that in the practical, you guys can do the, the lab and talk about. This one right here would be your, um, your, uh, your right, right, right um, maxillary so nine. Uh, down here, this would be your third, uh, your left third mandibular molar. So again, they're, they're, it's a mirror image on the right and left, upper and lower. Yeah. And of course, the, the, the Sizes are good for uh, eating an apple or a carrot. Canines are good for taking down your prey. And then uh, the molars, of course, are big and flat for grinding up that cranium granola, right? Yeah. And remember, you cheat the ducan in your tongue, keep the food over those molars as you're chewing up. All right, beautiful. Oh, this is showing some wisdom to you. These third molars doing some lanky things right there. I'm sure a lot of you out there, same situation. I don't know if I'm going to lose Ooh, This is showing a, a way of the uh, lingual frenulum here. Yeah. So these are your central incisors, lateral incisors, the canine teeth and out. Questions? And then they give them numbers. I want to ask you guys. Oh, child skull. Yeah, look at this. It looks like they're from aliens or something like that. But you have the. Uh, the adult teeth underneath the baby teeth. And uh, 
they will push their way up and then when we start losing teeth, the lower one will come up and replace it. So that is terrifying. Oh my God. Two sets. Two sets. Interesting. What if you can make a third set? Ooh, like at age 40, all brand new teeth, brand new enamel. I don't know in the future may be able to do that. But uh, you're going to see, once your teeth erupt, that enamel, if you wear it down, then you can't make new enamel. The enamel is made on the outside in. So once you once it erupts, the cells to make enamel are gone. So you can see, you know, as you wear it down. Uh, all right, we talked tooth anatomy. I mean, uh, clearly you all know the root and the crown. The crown is above the gum line, the roots beneath it. Yeah, and it's uh, sit in these sat in these uh, sockets in your maxillary and mandibular bone, these alveoli or sockets. Uh, and they're not they're not cemented onto it, but they have this ligament. They got this uh, collagen fibers, this ligament, so they can move a little bit. And you know, as you chew something, if it was cemented to the bone, they'd be more likely to crack. But in this case, they can move a little bit and uh, gives you some feedback as you're chewing on granola, your teeth moving. Actually, you know, your nerves realize that oh, I got something hard on my back. So the teeth are in these sockets. They're they're, they're tethered really strongly. They're trying to they're tethered strongly, but uh, they're not cemented. They can move. And uh, a tooth, if it's not an implant, is a living creature because it has a pulp cavity in the middle that's filled with blood vessels and nerves and connective tissue. And this pulp cavity has a little uh, a root canal at the bottom where the, the nerves and the blood vessels enter. Yeah, no, no, that is a root canal. But go ahead and use a drill to clean, clean that out and fill it up with cement. So as long as you have a root canal, as long as you have blood, that the tooth is alive and you can feel it. Um, if they fill it in, then it's no longer alive or you have an implant that's not alive, but it can still work as a tooth. Yeah, cool. And then the enamel you can see is that white up there, the white that you see on your tooth. And then most of your tooth, the inside is dented. So it's harder than bone, it's called dental. We'll talk about it. And here's a canine. You can see it just has one root in this case. You got that pulp cavity in the middle. And that's where you have the feeling in your tooth. You know, you, have, you could have a cavity that extends into here, and then all of a sudden, cold or hot things, you feel that and things like that. But um, normally, this is all buffered because uh, the enamel's nice, continuous cap on top of it. So you can see these little ligaments, these little uh, collagen fibers. They're called the periodontal ligament. You know, periodontal means around the tooth, right? Periodontal disease is around the tooth. So this ligament is going to hold the tooth into the socket. So let's talk enamel. Hardest substance in your body, harder than bone. And remember, bone is made up of uh, calcium, phosphorus, salts, hydroxyapatite, and uh, collagen, organic matter. These things with enamel, it's almost all the salt, not the organic matter. Look at that, 98%. So that is just like a crystal, man. It's got a little bit of collagen, you know, 2%, but it's more, that's why it's so hard. It's just calcium, phosphorus, and nature. It has to live up to all the wear and tear throughout you know, 100 years of our life. Yeah, cool. And so, yeah, you can, you can look at it microscopically, it's fascinating. It's just this hard, hard crystal, it's hard substance. You know, this person has a sealer that can kind of fill in these, these crevices. We'll talk about the cavities right there. Um, yeah, but here will be the, uh, the, the enamel will cover the entire crown, and then there'll be a little. Uh, where it meets, it's called cementum. Cementum is going to be shown here. Here's enamel. Enamel is the white at the top of your teeth, and that turns into cementum. And the root part. And so there's going to be a uh, enamel uh, cemental border here. But if your gums are receding, you can start to see more cementum. Normally, the gingiva of our gums will be up head against the, the tooth. Ah, oh, all right, you guys. Get good dental care. Uh, yeah, talk about uh, what can happen. Uh, so indeed, um, talk about a pandemic, a COVID pandemic. 
Um, the pandemic of dental, we call them caries. Dental caries. It's, it's a cat, right? But the carry is when uh, bacteria that are eating uh, sugars in your mouth, they secrete acids. So they're just like the waste product is acids, and the acids will slowly uh, drill holes in the enamel. So that is the issue. If you, whenever you eat food, if you were to brush your teeth and remove the sugar, you have a little chance of having carries. So if there's sugar caught in your teeth, um, that's going to feed the bacteria. There's a whole bunch of bacteria in your mouth, and uh, there's an acid, and the acid can drill holes in the enamel. And you don't notice it until that hole gets into the dentin and starts getting close to the nerves. The nerves are probably the dental. So the pandemic here is when cavities really, <laughs> really took off when we just we figured out how to make uh, refined sugar from sugar cane, sugar beets. And so it's interesting that cavities took off over the world when we figured out how to make refined sugar. Yeah. I guess they remained in Native Americans made maple sugar. Uh, anyway. Um, just realize that sugar came about and then we really got a, a lot of success. So um, fluorinated, our, our water is fluorinated. As I mentioned last semester, if you Google fluorinated water, you get all these people thinking that the government's trying to control our pineal gland and our mind by putting the water. So I'll try to cover that. But fluoride, we you know, on the teeth hardens the enamel. It binds and it makes it less likely to have cavities. So that's why we fluorinate the fluoride treatments in our teeth. Binds the enamel and it makes it less likely to have holes. Yeah. Uh, this shows, um, well, I just want to let you know how important dental care is. You can see in the United States, if you're a poor kid that doesn't have dental care, you're almost two times as likely to have more cavities than a kid that goes up in dental. And so, when you look at the world here, the, the yellow and the red, and there's a lot of uh, cavities. And what do you notice? I mean, uh, yeah, I mean, where there's richer countries, yes. It also has to do with diet, too. So these African countries are obviously not rich countries, but if you have a diet that is more, uh, less refined sugar, probably less likely to have problems with carries. And then you look at Mexico, South America, Eastern Europe, which is uh, has different vegetarian than Western Europe. So, Important to dental care, it's like you have your teeth for longer. All right, let's keep let's keep going. So uh, um, so dental caries, what are the percentages? Almost all adults have some caries. Right? It's near 100 uh, percent Kids, 60 to 90 percent. Because if you can not have a cavity for like six years, you're fine. You can use those teeth. But you can do that. It's a real common thing is to have these caries, especially since we have energy. So the cementum. I look at my teeth at home, it's actually one. I can see my cementum. So I see the white is, is the enamel just beneath it. Oh, here you can see that. And it's not as hard as it may. So you don't want to expose it. So normally, if your gums are not receding away, they will cover that, they will cover the cementum and give you some protection. So exposed cementum we don't like, but so you can see it's uh instead of being 98% mineral, it's like 65. So it's much softer than enamel, but it's still harder than bone. So if you look at the hardness scale, enamel is the hardest, then dentin, and then bone is, is softer than bone. The cementum covers the whole roof of the teeth. And interestingly, if you uh, shoot a bear, they can do it with fishers in New York, I know. You have to donate a tooth out of the, out of the bear. And the uh, state government will be able to section it and see how old that bear was. So, I mean, they hibernate, they have a different thing. Like, yeah, we, we can't do this with humans. There's no real way to date a human. I think there would be a way. So, if I want to say how old you are, you got to have a birth certificate because I can't age you by the teeth or anything, right? I find that fascinating. You can't age a person. I mean, relatively. But anyway, but you can't a bear because every day they go to hibernation and they wake up and you have these rings of cement. That's why they take a tooth out of the bear. Uh, they have the information about the population. All right, this is this ligament that holds the tooth to the socket. I think I've already ex expressed why that's important, right? You don't want it to be cemented onto it because then it's, you can get chipped more easily. You want a little bit of movement. It allows you to have braces too, because you can move the teeth you know, slowly. 
So there's this periodontal ligament, a bunch of collagen fibers that go from the, the tooth, the cementum of the tooth into the bone. You don't know why I put some oranges up in the corner? Okay. What about scurvy? If you don't get a vitamin C, your teeth fall out. Because you don't make collagen, the teeth get loose. Now, to be in impression, guys, I already talked about bones and your ligaments and your bones or your tendons. Uh, they don't just stop at the periosteum on the bone, they go into the fiber of the bone super strong. Same thing with this. The collagen fibers go into the teeth, so it's not just on the surface. So it's really a strong connection. Oh, God, I got a guy, a friend of mine, no, no dental insurance, talking about how he just drank a bunch of whiskey and used this uh, flyer supposed to. Oh, my God. There's nothing like tooth pain. I don't want to get out of that, get out get off on it, but tooth pain is almost drives you nuts. Right? So it doesn't go away. Anyway, if you want to pull your own tooth, you can, but uh, all is best. All right. all right, let's talk about so a dentin is an example of your teeth. Um, you can see what is this? Um, so more than bone. Uh, and it looks like this in the microscope, it has these tubes. And so if you have a dental cavity, a carry coming in, those tubes can transmit, you know, acids or coldness or the nerves can come up a little bit. So just so you know, once you can drill a hole through the enamel, as soon as you're in the dentin, you don't have to hit the whole cavity, there's a risk of doing that. Yep, so these dentin, these tubes make up the bulk of these Actually, dentin grows throughout your life. So that, that pulp cavity gets smaller and smaller. So you take a, like a 90-year-old guy, like a, a young 20-year-old person, the older person is going to have a smaller pulp cavity because the dentin slowly grows throughout your life. Now, the enamel, you cannot regrow. Before the teeth erupted, there was a membrane on top of the enamel that laid down the enamel from the top. And as soon as your teeth erupt, that's gone. So you can never make any more enamel. You can make more dentin because it goes from the inside out. So you make more dentin, no big deal. The enamel is the part that's going to wear away the most. So that pulp cavity, again, that's where you feel the pain. The nerves and blood vessels in there. Oh, God. All right. So interestingly, um, your teeth are always, they, they, if you want to be an orthodontist, you guys really understand your physics because you draw it out and you see they need to, to, to include with each other nicely like that. Like I said, if you lose a tooth, the other tooth keeps like reaching out. He's like hyper interrupting. Um, if you lose a tooth, your other teeth will drift in and fill it up. So your teeth will slowly move. They need that contact. So as you chew, your, your teeth are contacting each other. They're just this kind of feedback. Um, and uh, interesting, you look at a baby and a really old person, they have a similar face because their, their lower jaw is like really small. Because without teeth, your mandible uh, and maxilla, the, the bone just regresses. So the teeth, the constant moving, the hitting of your teeth strengthens the bone. Once you lose the teeth, your jaw gets they get very weak lower jaw. You get a real geriatric patient. Your jaw gets small. Yeah, so this how they, they contact each other is super important. And of course, that's the uh, the idea behind orthodontics or braces, right? I had them as a as an adult. Somebody else going to that. It's all these little kids and me, you know. What color do you want the braces to be? But um, this ability that we have is to uh, to just put um, pressure on the teeth. So if you put pressure on the teeth, let's say I'm pushing this tooth back, I put pressure on it, the bone behind it will start regressing as it has pressure on it. And then it will fill in the gap on the other side. So you can move teeth in slow motion. It's amazing, right? So no matter what your teeth are doing, at constant pressure, it's going to push on the bone, the bone starts reabsorbing, and it fills in the other side. You can move the teeth around. Beautiful. It's a slow motion. There's no like instant fix, but that's the idea behind orthodontics. It's fascinating. I think it's pretty cool. All right, the ginger is your gums, and that is uh, they either tightly on the bone. And the biggest issue really is uh, is uh, this little groove called a sulcus, this groove that gets plaque in it. So you get a bunch of uh, and 
you got to scrape that off, scrape, 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 get rid of that, or else the seeded. If the bone even regresses, then the teeth will fall out eventually. So you want gums. No, this is just looking at a, an x-ray. And I just put things you should, you should recognize the enamel is the hardest part. You have light up there, dented. You can see the pulp cavity in the middle here. Look at that root coming down here, the root canal. Yep. And periodontal and ligament is what tethers the teeth. So your incisors and your canines just have one root, and then you look at your, your molars have like three, four roots. And so this is a tooth, a tooth grinder. You can see that they've exposed the dentin in there. And then if you look at something like a horse or a deer, they have these complex teeth, and it's really worlds of dentin and enamel. And the enamel is harder than the dentin. So the dentin wears down, and it leaves these sharp cusps. They can chew plant materials. Cool. Here it is periodontal disease. Periodontal, like the perimeter of your tooth, not this tooth. You're seeing dandelions uh, from Dentaleon, like in French, the tooth of the lion. If you look at their uh, leaves, they look like little teeth. But anyway, so you can see this recession. So you're exposing the, the, the cementum, the gums are receding, the bone will recede, the bone will start to open down, the tooth become looser. So that's what you want to try to avoid. Yes. So older people that lose the teeth. All right. How about So you make a lot of spit. You make a lot of spit, and you have these three glands that you need to know anatomically. The biggest ones in front of your ear is parotid glands, and I feel that when I like eat a lemon or something, it kind of hurts right from the ear. Ah, it's like you're contracting there. And that parotid gland makes a bunch of spit and has a duct that comes out and empties in the upper second molar. And so sometimes you'll get a little bump there, but you can feel the water come out just in the outside of your second molar, the upper part. Then you have some mandibulars are below your mandible, your neck, and they go up underneath your tongue. And then sublingual is under your tongue. That makes sense. Submandibular below your mandible, sublingual below your tongue, parotid glands are in front of your ear. Um, saliva, yeah, the venom, the rattlesnakes, and the cobras, they used to work with rattlesnakes. They, um, they're modified saliva. And uh, you just take out the enzymes, you add a bunch of really toxic stuff, and you end up with this ability to inject into the venom. But salivary glands are just complex. They come from uh, this tube that makes all these bigger, 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 so you can make tons of product. The salivary gland is all, all these modules, all that make you spit, which is mucus. Water, right? Before you spit. And so the three ones, the parotids are up here, they're mostly um, watery, enzyme rich. The enzyme is called amylase. Amylase breaks down starches. So that's what the parotids do. The duct, as soon as you start eating something, even before you eat something, you feel the watery spit coming in the mouth. It comes from the big parotid duct. Uh, the disease mumps is if you have an infection, you look like a chip. Submandibulars below your chin, you got one on each side. Like you hear for swollen glands, it's rarely those, it's usually lymph nodes, but you have big glands underneath your chin, and a duct comes out under your tongue. So I'll show you. Oh, I'll show you the leaking. But then lastly, sublingual is a whole bunch of ducts, a whole bunch of glands under your tongue that make this really thick mucus. So parotid is mostly water, submandibular is a mix, under your tongue is mostly mucus. And you'll see if you guys are like hungry, want to eat, it's really watery spit. If your sympathetic nervous system, your fight or flight, it's usually like a thick mucusy, your mouth dries out and it's all thick. Yeah, so gleeking is uh, this ability to spit sometimes usually in two beautiful, graceful waterworks from your tongue. And it's simply the, the water down here, I mean, your glands are, are pushing it out through that. Oh, last slide. So how much do you make? Like over a liter. Oh my God. And if you like chew tobacco or you eat a lot, maybe like a two liter bottle filled with spit. Disgusting, right? But um, it all gets uh, goes, you swallow it, and then you reabsorb that water before it comes into it. So you make the spit up here, you get to reabsorb. And um, one important thing about this, and then you'll be able to like a meth mouth, you know, drugs sometimes make your teeth all fall out. But one issue, if you don't make spit, 
you get your teeth start getting really bad because spit has bicarbonate ions that neutralize the acid and keep your teeth healthy. So you need to have saliva. If you don't have saliva, your teeth get a lot of cavities and get really, really bad. All right, All right you guys, beautiful. Uh, it's as far as we're gonna get.